Hi everybody, I'm Don Dixon. I want to welcome you again back to our discussion on mechanics of fishing, a master class on the mechanics. When we started, I told you it involved action, size, color, speed of the lure, the depth of the lure. We also were going to include in this discussion on the mechanics, we were going to include uh, casting and trolling. We were going to include fishing gear. In other words, once we establish what our controls are, we have to know what gear we need to, to be able to apply those controls to our fishing. One of the things we tried to explain, I've tried a couple of different times in our earlier discussions, about what Buck meant when he said depth control. And we've gone, a, we've gone to a, such an extent that I think it's fairly well understood now that he meant when we're thinking in terms of depth control, it's a broad consideration, which should include all of our knowledge of a fish and what makes them tick. So with that being said, I thought one of the things that really helped trigger in my mind what Buck meant back in the early days were the only two tournaments I ever fished where they allowed trolling. Uh, they allowed trolling and I fished these two tournaments. One I've already told you about, the Muskie tournament, and uh, it was sort of fun reliving and remembering that. It was a great time. And uh, the other one I sort of introduced to you when we closed the other day about the walleye tournament in the Winnipeg River. Again, I felt like I had a sort of a too much of an advantage over the rest of the field, but Buck convinced me that it was good for uh, our attempt to reach the fishing world, and, and he said he expected me to win that so we could play it up in fishing facts and do all of the things that would, would help promote what we were trying to do, which is to educate the fishing world. So I said, okay, I'll fish it, and, and uh, when I got there, and I, I mentioned that I talked to Babe Winkleman, and and uh, I noticed a lot of the real well-known uh, walleye guys, uh, mostly from up north. Everybody I knew was there. They were there. The only exception was Al Linder, and he was scheduled to be there, but had to cancel at the last minute for some reason. That was our loss, because obviously uh, not only well-known, but a very accomplished fisherman, all species, but especially walleye. At any rate, uh, all the other quote pros in the business back then, they were all there. And they were all sort of committed as I was to, to helping to introduce a new generation of fishermen to the truth in fishing. So I got there just one day before the tournament started because my school was starting the following week and, and I didn't want to be away any longer than I had to. So and of course I didn't have to go do any practice fishing. I knew you know, I knew 25 miles of that river. I knew, pretty much knew from my past experience what was there. So at any rate, that night we had our dinner and we were introduced to our amateur uh, partners. And I had a nice young boy and I'm, <laughs> I hate to have to admit, I hope he's not watching, but I had a nice young man who I believe he was 19 years old. And uh, I think he was from Arkansas, uh, but he was, he was my partner. And the way they had set this tournament up, the boat could catch 10 walleye per day, two-day tournament, and of course trolling was allowed. Uh, but two-day tournament, 10 fish to a boat both days. So they said it didn't matter who caught the fish. In other words, the pro could catch all 10. It, it still counts for the boat. And, and or the, the, the amateur could catch all 10, and the boat weighs in 10, 10 fish. So I thought that was pretty fair. And uh, all of a sudden, I have a 19-year-old who was looking to, to fish with a pro, you know. And the first thing I did was introduce him to wireline, fishing with wireline. And I said, we'll be fishing between 35 and 60 feet deep. And he kind of looked at me with a strange look on his face. I knew he'd never pretty much, you know, expected or heard anything like that or expected that to be the case. And I said, listen, it's not that hard. I said, the hardest part is I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be driving a boat following this brake line. And I said, if you learn to keep your lure just right the way I'm going to teach you and feeling the bottom, if you learn to do it and you get the rhythm of it, you get this, this down, 
I said, you'll catch some fish. I promise you, you'll catch some fish. So he perked up a little bit, and, and I, I guess he sort of believed me. So we went to my number one spot, which is that saddle, which I've already told you about in the past. It's right outside the door of the, of the big lodge where we were all staying. And uh, it's a saddle. And then at the end of the saddle on the upstream side, there's a railroad trestle. It's, it's a bar-like feature that comes out. And I, I always would fish the, the saddle and the bar at the same time. It'd be one long pass. It'd take about 20 minutes, 30 minutes to make a pass. Uh, so I, I started doing what I've been doing for years up there. And it wasn't long. I mean, it, I don't think it was 15 minutes we had our first fish. And that first fish, I caught the fish, and it weighed nine pounds. And boy, my young partner, that just perked him right up. I mean, he got excited, and, and he said, I've never seen one that big. I said, you're going to catch one like that today. Do what I tell you to do now. And I said, we're going to catch him. You'll see. So we continued to fish, and I think it was, I caught another fish, about seven pounds. Had two fish in a boat. He's really excited now. And when I hit a specific spot at the railroad trestle or right at the bridge that I pretty much, when the fish are somewhat active, like they've shown that they were already that morning, uh, I expected, you know, that we'd catch fish. Sure enough, he hit a fish. So now we've got two fish in a boat, two sevens and a nine. And we're just getting started. We're not on the water a half hour yet. And when all of the boats launched, and I, I had heard that there were some crews that were there all week long doing some mapping and interpretation of their own. And not one person was in that section of the river where we were fishing. We were it. It was like our own private little fishing hole. Even though it's 200 yards or 300 yards long, the whole pass. Uh, but there was nobody there. Now, boats travel through that little neck down area that I explained to you once before about where that saddle is in a neck down area. And all of the water from the lake of the woods flows through that one spot. Current's about 12 mile an hour. Boats go upstream and downstream through that little spot and continue on, but nobody ever stops and fishes there. One of the reasons is they didn't know how to read the structure and or they don't like fighting all that current trying to fish. So uh, we had the place to ourselves, and we continued to fish, and we caught. And by the time we got to 10 fish, we were loaded. I mean, we were really loaded. And he said, there's no way anybody will beat this. I said, I, I think you're probably right. I think we probably got this thing made. As long as we don't sink the boat or something here by mistake, you know, I think we're in pretty good shape. I said, but let's continue to fish. And I said, we've got a couple of five-pounders in there to you know, uh, we catch bigger fish, we can always call them back out. I had my eye well turned on, you know, and run. So we kept fishing, and we ended up calling some fish. And when it was time to go into the weigh-in, our bag of fish, 10 fish, weighed 89 pounds. That's almost a nine pound average, obviously. And we had, I think we had three fish right at 10 pounds. And we had, I think, a couple of six pounders, and everything else was, you know, eight, nine pounds. Uh, so we had a tremendous bag of fish. Ten fish weighed 89 pounds. That, now, you'd have to be, I don't know who's going to beat that. Nobody's going to beat it. I, I mean, I knew that. And sure enough, nobody did. But here's what really surprised me. It was obvious, because of the fish we were catching, that there was a lot of activity. Those fish were active. We caught fish all day long. And at the same time, I was breaking in a kid who's never done it, never fished with wire and so on and so forth. And I think he ended up with what we had in the bag. I think we caught, we kept three of his fish. So he caught some fish. But I was still conscious of him doing the right thing and watching his rod and making sure that he had some success because, after all, that's really what the tournament was about. It wasn't about winning three grand. It wasn't about that at all. So at any rate, uh, we weighed those fish. And here's what surprised me. There were a few other fish caught, but not many. I believe that the second place, now keep in mind, we had 89, we weighed 89 pounds. I believe at the end of the first day, the second place finisher had seven pounds. 
I think it was three fish that collectively weighed seven pounds. That was it. That was second place. And I think there may be a, a third place guy had a couple of pounds, but there wasn't any fish being weighed. But yet the fish were really active. Now you can write it off and say, well, yeah, you already knew the spot. Well, I mapped that spot the first day I saw that river. For all of the reasons that I told you when we talked about structure types, I noticed a neck down of the above water terrain. And I suspected through my experience, through my knowledge, that there was probably a saddle there. So I searched for a saddle and sure enough, there was a saddle there. Then all I had to do was would do a detail map of the saddle to find out what brakes and brake lines were on or connected to that saddle and what the depths were. And then all I had to do after that was fish it and, you know, determining what lures I needed, what, you know, how to best fish it with the current and all that. Of course, trolling was the way to go. So it wasn't like that it was something that I discovered over a lifetime of fishing. All of a sudden, I can now have a tournament in my lifetime spot right outside my door. No. I discovered that spot the first day I ever was on that river. So I didn't look at it too much like, gee whiz, I have big, uh, an unfair advantage here. I looked at it like, what's the matter with people? Fish are moving all over this river system. They didn't catch any fish today. I mean, other than the few that I just told you about, there were no other fish being caught. Didn't catch any fish. And there was probably a hundred boats. You know, I, I thought there'd be, you know, everybody would have a limit of two pounders at least. I mean, if they were fishing even to 20 feet, they should have that. So I was really surprised. But my young partner had a smile on his face because, by the way, there was some good prize money for, for, the, for the amateur. Not, not prize money, but good prizes for the amateur. So he was all excited. He pretty much figured he had it made. So let me take you to day two. We go out day two, and I noticed probably 25, maybe 30 boats all in my spot from where I caught all the fish the first day. There was no professional courtesy on this at all. Uh, here's all of these boats. So I told my young friend, I said, listen, I know a bunch of other spots and I know another good spot. I call it the upper saddle. There's another spot up the river about six, seven miles. I said where uh, it's a real steep shoreline on the right hand side, but then there's an island sitting out in the middle of the river. And I said, the island is really big. So it, you know, if you look at that formation and and the shoreline over here, it's only about maybe 80, 90 yards wide. And right at that spot, there's a deep saddle. I said, now, I don't fish this one too often because there's always some a lot of northern pike on it. There's some walleyes. I've caught some big ones. I caught an 11-pounder there once. I said, but it's really rocky, and it's easy to get hung up where the one down below is not near as hangy. So I said, but since those other guys are down there fishing, let's just go ahead and we'll fish this saddle. Now, the procedure of how we're presenting lures and so on and so forth, we're going to be doing the same thing on this saddle. So he didn't have to change anything about the lure and working with wire and all of that. And on the very first pass we made, he had a hard strike and had a, what looked like a big fish. But right off the bat, I saw it. I saw that rod tip jump <laughs> like a northern pike, you know, sure enough. He brought it in as about a 10-pound northern pike. Now, he had fun bringing it in because he wasn't sure what it was, but I was pretty sure it was a pike when I saw how his rod was acting. But at any rate, I, I knew that the, there's, there's fish on there. There always is. So we fished that thing till about noontime. I think it was about noontime. We fished all morning. And we had a mixed bag of northern pike and walleye and we had caught a limit of walleye but not as big as the day before there were a couple of nice fish i think a couple in the eight pound class but most of them were four and a half five pounders and i think it was because all of the northern were around the walleyes were were uh not so prevalent on that spot but about 11 o'clock in the morning, I failed to mention this, we also hit another fish. Actually, I hit the fish. And uh, I knew right away, I thought it was a big northern. It turned out it was a muskie. And the fish weighed about, I don't know, probably 12 pounds, something like that. 
So the young man saw we were catching three different species of fish off the same structure, fishing in the same manner with the same lure, same rod, and so on and so forth. So it was some good experience for him, but that wasn't helping us with the walleye tournament. So about noontime, I said to him, I said, you know, let's take a run back down the river. We've got our limit of walleye, and no one's going to beat us. I mean, you know, if our limit weighed 50 pounds, you know, that would give us 100 and whatever it would be, 130, 40 pounds of fish. Ain't nobody going to beat us. I said, but uh, let's just run back down there to see if, if it's opened up a little bit that we might be able to fish it. Now, because we're fishing that area trolling, if there's a lot of boats in there, I can't fish it. With the current and a bunch of boats, you, you just did. But the guys that were in there, in the morning. I saw some back trolling, which is, I don't even know if anybody ever does that anymore. It was, it's sort of an antiquated way of slowing your speed, tro uh, your speed control down. Uh, but at that time, there were some guys back trolling. And it, when there's current like that, it's just not the way to go. Uh, but at any rate, that's what they were doing. Some other guys were just drifting and I could tell we were fishing with live bait. And then there were some other guys that looked like they were jigging, you know, must have had a real heavy jig and trying to jig drift and just blindly drift over the top of that saddle and jerk, a, you know, a lead head up off the bottom of the thing. They probably weren't having much success. There's a strong current. And if they were fishing in the manner that I saw them fishing when we first came out the door today, I thought they may not have stayed very long. Sure enough, we got down to that railroad trestle and there was not a boat anywhere and I knew that they had limited out on big fish and just went in and started drinking beer I knew that wasn't the case so I said okay we got about three hours I think we had to quit fishing like 3 30 or something so I said let's see if we can call some of those uh, what I considered smaller fish in a five pound class let's see if we get any big fish in here if, or if they've messed it all up for us first pass we hit a double Coming up over to Trestle, we both had a fish on at the same time. And both fish were in the eight pound class. What a very first pass. We called two of our five pounders with a couple of eight pounders. And we fished the rest of the three hours and we pretty much unloaded almost everything in our live well except the two bigger ones we had caught in the morning up at the other saddle. And we had loaded up again. And we had loaded up with about the same amount of tonnage. I think our final weight on that second day was like 80 pounds. So we had like 169 pounds. It seemed like it was 170 something pounds, as I recall. So here we have a two day total, 20 fish that weighed 170 pounds. Let's round it off, 170 pounds. All the other boats come in, all the way in done. Second place finisher had 16 pounds of fish. Now, I think third place had under 10. Third place finisher had like seven or eight pounds of fish. Nobody caught fish. And the fish were so active, I can't even begin to tell you. I mean, it was like taking candy from a baby. It was that simple. But you had to be in the right place, fishing in the right manner at the right time. Depth control. You had to take all of your knowledge, like I did the first time I saw that spot, and suspect that I was going to find a saddle there, which I did once I've turned the depth sonder on. Sure enough, there's the saddle. Then I had to establish the brakes and the brake lines on or connected to that saddle, which I did. It took me a, a half a day. And I map, uh, did a detail map of that entire 300-yard stretch of be most beautiful structure you ever want to see. And then all I had to do was figure out what lure to put on and what, what line to use, in this case wire line, to get to those depths to catch those fish. And then we just had to go out and do it. Like Buck says, depth control really, essentially is putting a lure where a fish is and moving it by them at the right time and moving it by them at the right speed. That's depth control. Well, we had depth control in the upper saddle. We caught a bunch of fish. And, and then I guess the the all of the boats, the 30 boats that were in the spot where all of the big fish were. I want you to think about this for a moment now. Really think about this. They were in the right place. All 30 boats were in the right place. They were sitting on top 
of the biggest group of the biggest bunch of big wall eyes they probably ever saw in their life. And nobody caught any. They didn't catch any. Why? Because their depth control was wrong. Their depth and speed was wrong. Not just one of them, but their depth and speed was wrong. They didn't have anything right. They were where the fish were, but they weren't fishing in the right manner. And they weren't fishing at the right depth. And like Buck said, all of the other things in fishing, you can throw out the window. If you don't have, if you haven't considered depth control, the action of your lure, the size of the lure, the color of the lure, the speed of the lure, where you fish, all of those things, uh, how good a caster you are, what a great troller you are, all those things you could throw out the window if you haven't considered depth control. The oldest truism there is in this game is you cannot catch a fish if you are fishing where there are no fish. Depth control. So here are all these fishermen, 30 boats, and each one of those boats had a professional walleye fisherman. At least six of them that I know of have TV shows. Many of them were high-class guides that have guided all over, you know, half of the country and, and know something about walleye. But yet, they didn't have this information. And therefore, without that depth control, without knowing about the depth control, which most of the fish, by the way, came from between 42 and 47 feet, but they didn't know what depth control, they, they were where, because I pointed it out to them the day before, they all knew where I'd fished. So they all went there. So they knew the where, but they didn't know the what. They didn't know what depth. And they didn't know how to determine what depth, obviously. Or if they did determine what depth, and recognize the brake lines and where they wanted to fish. They didn't know how to control their depth and speed against that current in order to control that depth and speed and catch fish. Something was off. Now you'd think, again, you'd think if you're fishing in a, in a tank that's a couple of hundred yards long, and there's just hundreds and hundreds of big walleye there, you would think that 30 boats that had 30 professional fishermen would catch some fish. But obviously they didn't. Not one big fish was weighed. The second and third place finishers, they had, they had small fish. And we had 20 hogs. Big fish. Again, don't get the wrong idea. <clears throat> I'm not telling this story to say, hey, look how great I am. No, forget that. You don't care. I know you don't care. Even my wife doesn't care. Only I care. I care about my success. I take it seriously. No matter what I'm doing, I want to win. I, that's just the way I am. But this isn't about me. What I want to try to bring about to you, and to me, this is what really showed this whole discussion on death control. It cleared it up for me. Buck says you got to have the knowledge. I got to know what the lake type is. It's a river. It has a current. I have to analyze my water. And what I expect to find in a river, I expect to find bars, humps, saddles. Where do I expect to find a saddle? Where I have a neck down in the above water observation of terrain. When I see that, I know I probably have a saddle, sure enough. So you see, I'm putting my knowledge of lake type together to get to that saddle. Once I got there, I had to uh, uh, map and interpret the brakes and the brake lines on that saddle. And in doing that, I accidentally ran across the bar that's connected to that, that railroad trestle bar. So now by doing my detail mapping, I've discovered a terrific structure that absolutely has to produce. There is no way that that structure will not produce fish. I already know that. I, and I've got good watercolor. And all was left was to get a lure down on those spots which I had just mapped. And then keep continually changing my speed control until I reach the one that works and pow. And when I caught the first fish, it was all over. They were there. And they were there when all those boats, other boats were in there too, but those guys didn't catch a fish because they didn't have this. It wasn't that they weren't me. They didn't have this. Because if they would have had this, somebody would have mapped that thing and got to fishing just the way that, that, that I had fished it in the past and that day and caught the fish because those fish were active all day long. 
but nobody caught any. Their depth control was wrong. So, if we wrap this up, if we analyze what the Muskie tournament was and what this other tournament was where they allowed trolling, it proves if you have the information, if you've done your studies, <clears throat> if you've read uh, Ben Hogan's book, all that's left is to go out on a practice range. And you can become a good golfer. If you read this, all that's left is to go fishing. And you can become a good fisherman. Obviously, there isn't anybody alive that can't learn what I learned. There's nobody alive that can't learn what I've learned. The biggest difference between me and a lot of other people that have read the material and quote the material day after day after day, they're always talking about, you know, Buck says, Buck says, Buck says, but they haven't actually gone out and done it. So I'm telling you the big difference between me and the rest of some of the fishing world, let's say some of the fishing world, is I got, I went out there. I, first I got this, I studied my, my written stuff, but then I went out and worked at getting good. And after I went fishing, I would always come back and reread. In the beginning years, this was all there was to read. I was reading it all the time. And today, I still pick apart some things after I have a certain fishing experience. I go in and check something, pick apart some things. I say, oh yeah, now I remember. And, and I'm just suggesting to you. First things first, before I can be a good golfer, I got to know what a good golf swing looks like. I've got to learn how to grip a club. But see, I can read that. I just go get Ben's book and, and read it. But in order to, to become a good golfer, I got to go out and grip that club. Then I got to develop that swing plane and hit a thousand balls every day for two or three years and then become a scratch golfer. Back in the early days when I was golfing, you'd end up go caddy and you carry two bags, make a little money. But the most most of the reason why we did that was because we got free golf. We could golf anytime we wanted. It was a public course, and we got free golf by by caddying. And we, we learned by practice. And that's what you have to do. But you can't practice something that you don't already know. And this brings me to my closing point on this. A lot of people will quote something as a truism. They'll say, well, I found out that this is true in fishing. Well, my question always is, well, who told you that? Where did you hear that? Where did you learn that? And consider the source. Many times I, I hear guys say things like it just almost, you know, you want to just laugh. The guy, the guy tell me something that sounded silly to me. And I'd say, man, where did you hear something like that? And he said, well, my barber's son has a buddy who's known as a pretty good fisherman. And he said that that's so. <laughs> Those kind of things just make me just break out in, in laughter. What's the science beside behind his comment? There's none. He's got an opinion. Everybody got an opinion. There's an old saying about that. You all know what it is. But everybody's got an opinion, but that doesn't make it so. Buck had opinions. He had theories, but he went out and proved it scientifically, went out and proved everything he ever wrote down to be fact. It's all fact. So I would tell people at clinics, somebody tell me something silly like that. They'd say, uh, you know, his barber told him, you know, uh, okay. I said, well, your barber was a barber for a living, right? Yeah. I'd rather take the word of a professional fisherman who, who spent his lifetime. And by the way, he's got a 200 IQ. He's a genius. And I'm going to take his 50, 60 years of research that he did in all different types of water all over God's creation under all weather and water conditions for all species of fish. And he came to this absolute for sure uh, uh, proof that his theory was a fact. And then he wrote it down. So I would consider the source and say, if I'm you, I would believe this guy. He's the only true Ben Hogan that we have in fishing. He's the only one. I know there's a bunch of golfers, but there's not a bunch of this guy. There's only one. Nothing in fishing of any value has been said since I've been around it in the last 50 years. Not one thing has been said of value. 
that Buck hasn't already said. So many guys today, they'll pick something out of Buck's materials and his findings and they'll put a different name to it and call it something else in an attempt to build their name. But nothing's been said in the last 50 years that Buck hadn't already said. He had it all. He had all of the truth. And that's the reason, by the way, I'll tell you today and I'll leave you with this, because Don Dixon never had an original idea about a fish in his life. I have not. Nor do I plan on having some revelation and having some something, you know, lightning strike and all of a sudden I have this brand new something or other that I can share with you. It's not going to happen. But I was smart enough. I was smart enough to listen to what this guy had to say and study it and then go out and apply it. And then I had a 40 year career in fishing. And I've had a ton of success. And guess what? You can do the same. You don't have to be a genius. You can be just like me. Pretty ordinary in most all ways. But I was smart enough to get my book. Get my Ben Hogan book. I was smart enough to get my Buck Perry book. Because fishing is what I wanted to do. And I didn't enjoy not catching fish. i share one last little statement with you. I had an email from a guy the other day, just two days ago. He said, you know, I can't tell you how much I appreciate these vlogs and your stories and so on and so forth. He said, I gave up fishing about 15 years ago, he said, after having about a 10-year period where I was busting the bank with no results. I was so deflated and so disgusted, I quit fishing. And now, he said, after being directed to your vlog from a couple of my friends, he said, I'm re-energized. I'm ready to get back at it. And he said, my only goal today, my only source of, of good times, he said, is learning how to fish and my grandbabies. <laughs> and then he signed his name, a uh, fellow from Western Kentucky. So if you want to, for whatever your reason for doing it, if you want to become really successful, first, you have to get the information, all of the information that I've talked about today. And then you got to get out on that practice tee. You got to get out there and start hitting balls. You got to get out there and learn how to present a lure, learn how to present lures deep, uh, learn how to work most of you, learn how to work with wire, learn how to be a better caster, learn how to cast deep structure, learn how to check all your depths and speeds, learn how to uh, take a reservoir and, and even if it's 200,000 acres and within a half a day, you've got all of the answers you need to go out there and catch a bunch of fish. That's what I'm trying to relay to you. It can be done because Buck already did all the hard work. He gave us the knowledge. All we had to do is take it in. So I hope that's what you're doing. I really enjoy talking with you. I appreciate you being with me. And I, I want to ask you to follow us on Facebook and, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I also want to tell you, we're going to be doing some special things on the water coming up pretty soon. And there's some things I'm going to only do for my subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed, you need to. And at the same time, I'm looking forward to seeing you the next time.